Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Dinardis, Professor and Interim Dean of the School of Communication at American University. And it is truly a privilege to welcome you to the special event featuring the latest book by my colleague, Professor Joseph Campbell, called Lost in a Gallup, Polling Failure in US Presidential Elections. Um, some of you uh, might have noticed that we are in the immediate run-up to a presidential election that is possibly one of the most consequential in our lifetime. And some of you probably also remember the 2016 election and how many polls simply got it wrong. Now, what about the polls and journalist predictions about the coming election? Will they be wrong again? I, um, I'm going to open up the book to page 205, and uh, Professor Campbell says, almost surely they will. It's a lot more nuanced than the way I just said it, but I'm so excited about this um, discussion today. Um, Lost, in Gallup, Lost in a Gallup is a, um, it's a must read in this moment, examining historical cases of polling failures in US presidential elections, and arguing that polling failures are also journalistic failures. Professor Campbell is the right person at the right time to write this book, um, already hailed as, um, as one person describes it, a bracing reality check. He's a writer, an educator, a historian, a media critic, blogger, and of course, a professor at American University School of Communication. Here at American University, uh, I just want to <clears throat> also mention, um, I don't want to embarrass my colleague, but he is an award-winning professor, the recipient of many honors, including, uh, just to mention one, faculty member of the year, that award from the American University student government. Uh, before entering the academy and uh, getting his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Dr. Campbell was a professional journalist for some 20 years, and it's a career that took him across um, North America to Europe, West Africa, and parts of Asia. Critics have referred to Professor Campbell, the students love this, as, quote, the man who calls journalists on their own BS and the master of debunk. Um, the, the book uh, that we're discussing tonight is Professor Campbell's seventh solo authored book since joining the American University faculty in 1997. And I was very interested that um, Jake Tapper, CNN anchor and chief Washington correspondent said about my colleague that, quote, whenever I get a chance to read Campbell's work, I seize it. Campbell's work always opens my eyes, challenging assumptions the world has turned into facts. Um, this is obviously a brilliantly timed book in advance of such a consequential election and in the, um, the context of very heightened interest and concern about polls. Um, the book and this event couldn't have been timed better. I'm also thrilled that this event is a collaboration with the School of Public Affairs at American University. And I wanna give a special thanks to Professor Candace Nelson, our colleague in um, SPA, the School of Public Affairs, for joining us tonight. Now moderating the event is my colleague, Dr. John Watson, journalism professor in our School of Communication, author of the book, Journalism, Journalism Ethics by Court Decree, and the recipient of the prestigious Ida B. Wells Award. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. We really appreciate your presence here tonight. I want to congratulate my colleague, Joe, on yet another impressive and timely book. And it's a pleasure now to turn the program over to Professor John Watson to moderate and introduce the panel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Laura, for those great introductions. Uh, I will be serving as moderator for this program. And I will try to keep um, the questions that you, the members of the audience, uh, pose to the panelists. Um, and I may add a few questions of my own in hopes of getting all aspects of the book covered. I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce the other member of the panel, uh, Professor Candace J. Nelson. I wanted to give her a more uh, rounded um, introduction. Uh, she's a professor of government in the School of Public Affairs at American University, and she is the author of Grant Park, The Democratization of Presidential Elections, 1968 through 2008. And she is also the co-editor of Campaigns and Elections, American Style, 
with James A. Thurber. Um, Professor Nelson is also the academic director of the Campaign Management Institute at American University. So let's get started with the, the concept that is foremost, at least on my mind, um, whether the upcoming presidential election and the polls that we're already reading, will they get it wrong again? Um, it's an open question. Could the polls misrepresent what's going to happen? Right now, everybody knows that Biden is well ahead. I think we all recall another election where a candidate was well ahead and the results did not match the predictions. Okay, So um, perhaps, Joe, you could uh, jump in at this point and give us some, somewhat of a preview. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks to Laura Donardis for that fine introduction. It's, it's great to be here this afternoon, and uh, absolutely, polls can fail. Polls are not prognox, uh, prognications. They're not prophecies. Polls can error, and uh, if the history of, of election polling tells us anything, is that, that summertime polls can really, really dissipate. The leads in summertime polls can dissipate in a real hurry in the fall. Just ask Michael Dukakis in 1988, who had a double digit lead over George H.W. Bush. Dukakis wound up losing that election in 1988 by almost eight percentage points. Or consider the case of Thomas E. Dewey in 1948 in the famous Dewey defeats Truman election. Dewey had a double digit lead in the summertime of 1948 and lost to Harry Truman by 4.5 percentage points. And even in the earliest days of what we consider to be modern election polling, it's pretty clear that pollsters can get it wrong in the summertime. George Gallup in 1936 in his first presidential election in July of 1936 had Alf Landon, the Republican governor of Kansas and the Republican candidate for president. He had Alf Landon slightly ahead in the electoral college vote. In 1936, Franklin Roosevelt won the election in November in an overwhelming landslide in which Alf Landon won two seats, two states, eight electoral votes in all. So surely elect, uh, polls, election polls and, and the leads that they show in, in the summertime can, can evaporate in the fall. And not all polls are showing Joe Biden well ahead of President Trump. The well-regarded Emerson College poll in June and July, its horse race poll in June and July, both showed that Biden had a four point lead, a fairly narrow lead over Trump. And uh, the Emerson College poll is, is, is a well-regarded poll. It's, it's one of the top ranked polls by the 538.com predictions and polling analysis site run by Nate Silver, who we'll probably talk about a little later today. So there's a lot of factors here. And almost certainly, yes, polls can dissipate. There's nothing locked in right now. And um, Joe Biden's lead may look formidable, but it could also dissipate. Thank you. Um, Candace, do you have a question you'd like to ask? I just want to pick up on what Joe said. Um, many Americans aren't paying attention to the election right now. Uh, that's true in any election, but I think it's particularly true now. People are worried about their jobs, their health, their family's health. If they have school-aged children, what that's going to look like. A lot's going to happen in the next month. Joe Biden is going to pick his vice presidential nominee probably sometime next week. Then we'll have both party conventions. So I think the race may, may change between now and Labor Day. Uh, and then once we get into the last two months, you know, we'll see what happens with the economy. We'll see what happens with the pandemic. We'll have the presidential and vice presidential debates. So what we're seeing now in no way portends what's going to happen in the fall. Okay, Joe, before we get deeply into the meat of the book, could you explain to the audience what the title lost, of a, lost in a Gallup actually means and, and why it's so clever? It's, uh, it, it's derived, John, from a humorist's observation in the aftermath of the 1948 election, which I mentioned a, a moment ago, in which uh, Thomas E. Dewey was upset by President Harry Truman. And the comment went after the election that Truman was the first president to lose in a gallop, but win in a walk. Now, humor since 1948 has, has changed quite a lot, but uh, 
it meant that uh, he was behind in the Gallup poll, but won fairly easily in the uh, election in November 1948. Truman won by 4.5 percentage points. And Gallup's final poll had Dewey ahead by more than five points. So lost in the Gallup is derived from, from, that, uh, from that occasion, from that humorist's observation. And it was one of the titles I suggested to the um, senior editor at the University of California Press, which is the publisher of the book. And his name is Reed Malcolm, and I've worked with him on, on my last three or four book projects. And uh, Reed liked this title best of all. I was, I was proposing something of a more pedestrian title like When Polls Go Bad, something along those lines. And Reed kind of liked the uh, Lost in a Gallop, and, uh, and it became the title of the book. Can you give us some of the backstory of how this book came together and uh, what motivated you to do this massive amount of work to produce this? Indeed, it's, uh, uh, it stems from election night 2016. Uh, actually, the, the, the wee hours of the morning on the day after the election. And I crafted a, an essay for my Media Myth Alert blog that said, in a sense, that the outcome of the 2016 election was like that of 1948 for the news media, in which they were so certain about the winner of the outcome and then only to be proven wrong. And so I stayed up till three or four in the morning after the election in 2016, drafting this, this essay, this article that I posted later in the morning at Media Myth Alert. And I began thinking right away about whether this could be polling error could become the next book project because at the time I was looking for another book to take on. And for a while I was thinking, well, maybe I'll take a look at the uh, election in 1936, which was an enormous polling failure by the then uh, leading news magazine, Literary Digest. They predicted that Alf Landon was going to win comfortably that year and unseat Franklin Roosevelt in the 1936 election only to lose badly, only to misfire badly. Franklin Roosevelt won easily in that election and the Literary Digest's poll was off by nearly 20 percentage points. I thought that alone might make for an interesting year study about the year 1936, uh, centered around the Literary Digest. But the more I looked into 1936, the uglier that year looked to me and I was really reluctant to want to spend a whole lot of time with a, an ugly year. It was the year we were still fairly deep in the depression in 1936. The Nazis were in control in Germany. There were demagogues afoot in the United States, characters like Father Charles Coughlin and uh, the, the radio priest of uh, suburban Detroit, a, a real anti-Semite. So there were all these, these really odd and ugly characters out there. And I wasn't really thrilled with the, uh, the notion after all of a 1936 book. And the more I discussed it with the University of California Press, Reed Malcolm in particular, the more it became clear that we could do a, a study of, of polling failure in American presidential elections in a way that had never been done before. This catalog of presidential election polling failure has never really been taken on previously. There have been individual cases looked at, but never in a, in a, in a total catalog. So that was, the, uh, that was the idea and that was the backstory. So I, I really do think it began on election night or the morning after the wee hours after the election of 2016. And, uh, between the time the proposal was submitted to the University of California Press in October of 2017 and the time the final manuscript was submitted was a period of 25 months. So it was a lot of work and, and uh, I, I made profitable use of a, of a faculty sabbatical in the uh, spring of uh, 2018. Without that sabbatical, this research probably couldn't have been done. It couldn't have been completed. So it was, it, was, uh, it was quickly done, the uh, quickly researched. And uh, after submitting the manuscript, of course, there was, there, were, there, were, there was copy editing to go through. The press hired a wonderful copy editor named Madeline Adams. And uh, there, was, there was proofreading, indexing, and everything. So it was not finally completely wrapped up until May of this year. So that's a long backstory, John. Yes, <laughs> but it just gives an idea of how much work goes into producing uh, a book of this of this quality. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, it, it goes to a theme that is recurring uh, in the book, um, because you uh, correlate polling failure with journalistic failure. 
What does that mean? It means that very often journalists take their lead from, from pre-election polls and they take their, they base their pre-election narrative on, on polling and what polls have to say about the race. And these days, since at least uh, the late 1970s, many large news organizations, CBS News, The New York Times, CNN, among others, are into polling themselves. They're, they're doing polling on their own. And so polling really helps to set the narrative for, for journalists about the election. It's the way in which journalists, their readers, under, and, and their audiences understand the dynamics of a presidential election. So when polls go bad, when polls go wrong, when polls misfire, there is the real tendency to have journalistic error as well, that, 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 that the narrative that journalists put out misfires as well. And we saw that in the, in the 2016 election. The, the shock of that outcome was profound and, and it was profound among journalists as well. In fact, there was a fair amount of criticism about journalists for not having anticipated the outcome of that election, for not having anticipated or pre prevented, presented clues to their audiences that the election could turn out in a way that they thought was impossible. Journalists in, in, 19, in 2016 were guilty of what has been called the unthinkability bias. It was unthinkable that a character like Donald Trump would win the presidency. So they just kind of thought that was, that was out of the question. And uh, it was uh, to their detriment to buy into the unbelievability notion. Candace, you were prepared to jump in on some point here? One of the things that I thought was most interesting in the book is Joe talks about the sort of fraught relationship between journalists and pollsters early on, once we started having polls. And as he just said, that's really changed now. Uh, journalists really are dependent on polls uh, to tell us what's happening in a particular election or what's happening right now. Um, so that I thought was a really interesting sort of change in the relationship between pollsters and, and journalists. What are some of the things that journalists tend to misunderstand or misrepresent in polling data that they report on? You know, if you talk to pollsters, you'll, you'll hear them complain about journalists not understanding the intricacies of polling. And it goes beyond the margin of sampling error. It's, it's more about how polls come together and how polls are, are conducted. And, and those intricacies pollsters complain, tend to complain, are not well understood by journalists. Uh, the book, by the way, Lost in a Gallop, is not a methodology book. It's not about a book about how polls are done and, and, uh, and, and some of the intricacies of, of polling and the experimentation that characterizes the field these days. There's all sorts of different approaches. No longer is random digit dialing telephone calling with live operators the way that polls are conducted. I mean, some pollsters do conduct it that way, but that is no longer the gold standard in, in, uh, in opinion research, largely because people don't answer the phone. A lot, a lot of people are getting rid of landlines and uh, people with cell phones can be reached, but they're harder to reach. So there's a lot of churn. There's a lot of, there's a lot of experimentation in the field of polling these days. And I'm not sure that journalists really fully grasp how intricate that is and how how much experimentation is going on it's a very very lively pursuit it's a very lively field with a lot of uh, experimentation with with internet-based polling for example and even social media is seen as an option for for getting polling data or data about how uh, decisions are going to be made by the by the populace so uh, there's there's as i say an awful lot that's going on in polling these days and i'm not sure journalists have a real good handle on that when you look at the history of when polling failures have occurred, are you referring to only the big misses in the raw voting results, or do you also include the fine-grained predictions of electoral, electoral college results? Oh, and by the way, um, members of the audience, feel free to pose questions, and I will be reading them um, as time allows to the panelists. One of the points in Lost in a Gallup is that polling failures are not all alike. Just as no two presidential elections are the same, no two polling failures are quite alike either. And there are all sorts of different polling failures. They don't spring from the single template 
of say the Dewey defeats Truman election of 1948, when every, when all the polls thought that that Dewey was so far ahead there was there was no chance of of Truman winning that election. That's one model. Another model, if you will, of polling failure, another typology of polling failure has to do with landslides that are missed, that pollsters anticipate a very close election and then a landslide happens. And this is what we saw in 1980, 40 years ago. Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter were locked in supposedly a very tight race right to the end of the campaign. All the pollsters were figuring this was gonna be a very very close race. The CBS New York Times poll, the final poll that the that, that polling operation conducted had a one point lead for Ronald, Ronald Reagan. Reagan wound up winning the election by nearly 10 percentage points, near landslide margins. So there's, there's that kind of, of polling failure. Another type of polling failure discussed in the book has to do with exit polling and how exit polls, which are conducted mostly, mostly on the day of the election with people who have just voted in, at their polling place. Exit polls have been wrong. In 2004, exit polls indicated that John Kerry was going to defeat the incumbent George Bush for the presidency. In fact, one of, one of John Kerry's senior advisors, a guy named Bob Shrum, called Kerry to his face at the uh, late on uh, election day, Mr. President. He believed that the election, uh, that the exit polls were pointing to Kerry's win in the election. So there is that kind of polling failure, that typology. And we've, we've seen venerable pollsters like the Gallup organization misfire as well. In 2012, the Gallup organization had Mitt Romney ahead of Barack Obama throughout the campaign. And at the end of the campaign, it was a one point lead that Gallup said that Romney had uh, over, over Obama. And Obama won that election by nearly four percentage points. So we've had these cases of venerable pollsters, well-known pollsters, well-respected pollsters failing. And it was the last presidential election that, that Gallup has, uh, has, has polled. Uh, and we've also seen cases like in 2016 when state level polls kind of screw everything up. And the outcomes in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, to a lesser extent in Florida and North Carolina, really uh, upset the, uh, the expectations that poll-based statistical modelers had, had, uh, had conducted. The Huffington Post, for example, based on state polling, figured that Hillary Clinton had a 98.2% chance of winning the election. The New York Times upshot model had Hillary winning with an 85% probability. Nate Silver's 538 had uh, Hillary ahead fairly easily with a 71% chance of, of winning the election. And these, these statistical based models were all based on, on or largely based on, on state polls. And in key states, I mentioned Ms. Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania for three, those polls misfired. Had Hillary Clinton won those three states, she would have won the presidency. So there are different kinds of polling failure, and that's one of the key points made in Lost in the Gallup, that there are different kind, types of polling error and polling failure, and it's not all one template that, that applies. Uh, another question from the uh, audience. Is the rise of poll aggregators something that helps us understand polls, or is it something that hinders our understanding? Well, all polls are not equal. I mean, how there's how the, what the sample is, how they're conducted, whether they're um, using cell phones or landlines, uh, whether they're internet polls or not. So it's important to understand how each poll is conducted, how the questions are asked, what the sample is, um, to understand the results. And aggregating sometimes misses that. It can, and it really is is uh, is an important point to to delve deeply into how polls are conducted, and uh, the transparency of opinion polling is is uh, is getting pretty good actually. Uh, but uh, aggregation can also give us a pretty good idea as to who who overall is ahead, and the Real Clear Politics uh, website is an aggregator and of all kinds of polls, and in 2016 its final analysis had Hillary Clinton ahead by about three percentage points. And she won the election by 2.1 percentage points, the popular vote, I mean. And so she, uh, the, the Real Clear Politics aggregation site, came pretty close to, to pegging the national vote. 
of course, the electoral college is what really matters. And uh, uh, that was, that was uh, an upset. It was an unexpected outcome in 2016. And, uh, but uh, the Real Clear Politics site does a pretty good job. Now, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote in 2016 pretty clearly, but it's interesting to delve a little more deeply into the numbers because if, if not for an overwhelming victory that she rolled up in California, she defeated Trump by more than 4 million votes. Uh, and that margin in California was enough to wipe out Trump's plurality in the rest of the country. In the other 49 states, Trump won the popular vote, but with California and the uh, wipeout that he had there, uh, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. So the polls came in nationally fairly closely to what the aggregate of pollsters was, uh, was saying. But uh, again, the Electoral College is what matters. Is there any modern poll where we see how a nationwide calamity affects the election with an incumbent? Um, let's rule out 1936 because it was too strange and 2008 because there was no incumbent. But is there any evidence that polls get it right when the poll is clearly a referendum on the incumbent? Is there well, any correlation? It sounded like there were two questions there. Uh, the 2012 election comes to mind. It was, it was said to be a fairly close race between Mitt Romney, the Republican, and, and the incumbent uh, President Barack Obama. And then the Superstorm Sandy hit late in, August, late in October. And Obama's high-profile response to that storm really is said to have helped put him over the top in, in uh, clinching the election that year. That's a recent example of how a, um, a late breaking development, if you will, an October surprise even, can have, can have an effect on the polls. And some people say that uh, James Comey's decision, the FBI, then FBI director, his decision in late October 2016 to essentially reopen the case about Hillary Clinton's uh, private email server, uh, that news uh, helped cost her several percentage points and perhaps even the election. So October surprises can happen, and they can have a devastating effect on a, on a candidacy. Uh, George Bush in the year 2000, 20 years ago, was uh, narrowly ahead in, in the popular vote. And then word was leaked, word was reported that he had concealed a DUI conviction several years earlier. He had been arrested and, and had pleaded guilty to a DUI charge in Maine many years earlier, and he had never disclosed that. And a, and a young reporter in Maine uh, broke the news shortly before the 20, uh, 2000 election. And that probably had the effect of, of swinging some, some uh, votes from Bush to Gore late in the race. And that, and that election came out to be one of the tightest in American history. So yeah, late breaking events can, can matter a lot in an election. And elections are, uh, polls are a snapshot in time. So in 1980, as Joe said, it was very close going into the weekend before the election. And then the hostages weren't released. And so everyone who made up their mind over those last two or three days ended up voting uh, for Reagan. We saw in 16, people who made up their mind late um, in the election broke for Donald Trump. So. A lot can happen, you know, in that last week, 10 days, four days. That's for sure. And uh, if there is a large number of undecided votes, that can be a very difficult thing for, for pollsters to, to get right. And just how to allocate the undecided, which way are they going to break? Do you ignore them altogether or do you allocate them in some percentage fashion? That has been a, a conundrum facing pollsters for, for many, many years. And they still, you know, have trouble with undecided, with large numbers of undecided votes. And, and Candy's right, in 2016, quite a few undecided voters broke for, broke for Trump very late in the election, especially in key states, including Florida, Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. And those, those late deciders made a big difference in, in, uh, in those narrow victories he had. You have a sense of how much uh, stock the political cam campaigns themselves place in these polls. Is there a difference between 
their faith in their own commission polls and the polls done by independent, very often academic institutions. All, all, all campaigns do their own polling and that's where they put their, their trust. Uh, one of the problems in 2016 is the Clinton campaign believed their models that Joe referenced. And so they stopped polling in the last month. So they missed things that were happening in Michigan. They were hearing on the ground in Michigan that, you know, voters aren't locked in here. You know, you've got to send people out. You've got to go door to door. They believed their models and um, we saw what happened. And uh, Clinton didn't campaign in the fall in Wisconsin at all. Not that that alone would have made a difference, but it's emblematic of the of the belief that this was was locked was a lock for her, and um, and it wasn't. It wasn't. Okay. Um, sometimes it, it may seem that the failure of polling isn't about polling per se, but rather the failure to anticipate voter turnout correctly. How has that played into polling, uh, polling failures historically, and how might it uh, affect the outcome this time around? One thing that pollsters have long struggled with, and they've never really come up with an answer for it, is, is how to weed out among the respondents to their polls, how to weed out those who are really going to vote, how to weed out the likely voters from the, from the non-likely voters. And there are all kinds of different models and methods that pollsters use to determine or try to determine who the most likely voters are. And those screens vary by pollster. In fact, there's, there's a line in the book that says there are probably as many likely voter models or screens as there are pollsters. And if you, if you have a screen that is run too tight, you, you remove voters, people who are actually going to vote. And if it's too loose, you have people in there who say they're going to vote but don't. Many people tell pollsters they're going to, they're going to vote and, and wind up not, not going to the polls. And in this country, what, 50, 55 percent, maybe a little more of the electorates, the eligible voters, do turn out on election day for a presidential election. So there's a, quite a few people who do not vote. And, and that really is a conundrum for pollsters. As I say, one that they've recognized for, for many, many years and have really struggled with throughout the, throughout the time of, um, throughout the history of, of opinion research. And it also depends on what the campaign thinks the electorate is gonna look like. In 2012, the Romney campaign didn't think that the Obama campaign was gonna get the same levels of turnout among African Americans, young people, um, that he got in 2008. He, they just didn't think the electorate was going to look the same in 2012 as it did in 2008. It didn't exactly look the same way, but it looked much more like 2012 than the Romney campaign anticipated. That's right. That's another. It's another conundrum that pollsters face is trying to figure out what that electorate is going to look like. Who's going to show up on election day? So they have to, in that sense, it's, it's a bit more art than science. They're going to have to determine, well, okay, it's likely to look like this. It's, you know, it may look like that. And, and, uh, and that determination, too, uh, is a very important factor. And it's, it's, it's one of those that is really, really difficult to pin down. It's another source of potential error in, in election polling. And the challenge that we're going to face in 2020 is how people are going to vote. Uh, are they going to, are more people going to vote with mail-in ballots? Uh, how will those be counted? How do you know? Uh, there's some thinking out there that Republicans may be more likely to vote in person. Democrats may be more, more likely to vote with mail-in ballots. We've seen in some of the primary elections that it takes a while to get those ballots counted. So that's another sort of question that's, that's in the mix for 2020. Uh, this is something I'd like to ask both panelists to weigh on. Do you think or believe there is an entertainment bias in news coverage in that there is a, a drive to know who is ahead in the presidential race and that drives all the decisions about coverage? Uh, we, members of the public, need to know who wins on election night and we're not used to having to wait a long time for results. And coverage seems to be geared toward presenting a winner on an election, like, an election night, much like we seek in a compelling, dramatic movie or play. The well, that that sounds like elections and how we run them in, in the United States. I don't know what the, enter, 
maybe there is entertainment value in it, but there's also uh, a good deal of anticipation. And uh, there's a fair amount of criticism about horse race journalism or horse race polling. And uh, I tend not to be too comfortable with that kind of criticism. I think that who's ahead, even during the campaign, is an important piece of information that we should know in a, in a functioning democracy. I think that, that people have a right to know that and ought to know that. And it's, it's, it's perhaps the most interesting question out there before an election. Who's ahead? Who's likely to win? And if journalists can give us a clue as to who's, who's going to win, that's important information to share. It's important information to have. But um, you, know, you find all kinds of people who criticize and have criticized for many years horse race journalism as, as uh, uh, missing the point, as, as sort of focusing on who's ahead to the, to the detriment of a discussion of issues. And uh, I just think that that's, that's very short-sighted. That's a very short-sighted view of, of, of campaign coverage. And I think journalists have done a much better job of getting into polling data, not just who's ahead, but what groups of people are voting for each of the candidates. What are the issues that people care about? So I, it, as Joe said earlier, I think there is much more transparency in, in, in what the polls are telling us. Yeah, I, I'm one of those, um, really old fashioned journalists who, who still question the, the ethics of using polls as the basis of a news story. But when I think of journalism's mission, ethically based mission, it's to provide the public with information they can rely on in making decisions about important things. In a democracy, the election of a president is probably the single most important decision they make but providing reliable information about that to help them make a decision, I don't see how polls fit into that equation at all. They're not reliable. And what information do you give the public that would help them make a decision if the information is fundamentally, this person is more popular right now? Well, it's, it, as Candy mentioned earlier, it is a snapshot in time. It does tell us something about the moment and the campaigns and where things stand. I don't think that's irrelevant or unimportant information at all. I think it's, 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 it's important information that journalists have long recognized as important to offer their audiences. There were crude proto polls being done as long ago in this country as 1824 and perhaps even earlier. But the 1824 election was, was one in which there was a fair amount of, of competition and a good deal of interest and, 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 and some newspapers back then were conducting polls. So the, the intersection of journalism and, pollsting and polling goes, goes way back. And I mentioned the Literary Digest early on today. That was a news magazine, perhaps the leading news magazine at the time, and it had conducted polls of presidential elections uh, from the early 1920s, and it had never been wrong until it was wrong badly in 1936. But the larger point here is that it is representative and emblematic of the importance of polling and to journalism. So this symbiotic relationship is one that is longstanding and has, has a deep pedigree and is, is important to this day. And I think that it's important information to tell people what, what other people are thinking I mean, that's an important component of, of American journalism. And to do that and to offer that kind of information in reporting about polls is, is to fill, fulfill a journalistic function. And I would disagree that polls are unreliable. I think they are reliable, but public opinion changes depending on what's happening in the country or in the world. So they're reliable when they're taken, but they could be you know, less accurate two weeks, you know, we don't know who Joe Biden's going to pick for his vice presidential nominee. That may well change um, in terms of his polling um, once, once that announcement is made. Polls can be uh, unreliable and, and polls can go awry. I and mean, it's pretty clear from, from the history of election polling that that is the case. But, but not all polls are wrong. And I, don't, I think it's, it's uh, an improper premise to say, yeah, polls are unreliable, therefore we shouldn't be basing these pre-election stories on, on polling. I think we should treat polls warily. We should recognize that they can be an error, that there are a lot of contaminants, potentially, that, that infiltrate polls. But, you know, I think it's better to, to conduct opinion polling 
than it is to rely on what is called shoe leather journalism, going out and talking to the proverbial man in the street. I mean, those kind of soundings can give you some indication of what's going on, but they can also be very, very misleading. Just like yard signs can be a very misleading indicator. Some people put a lot of stock in, in what yard sign count there is, but in the end, they can be terribly, terribly off. So polls, while flawed on, on, in some respects, are not necessarily always unreliable. Okay, given that we all agree that a, a poll is a snapshot, a snapshot of people's opinion in time, maybe, I would think they would be useful if the election were held immediately after that poll. Otherwise, we all know that stuff changes between the poll and the time people walk into the voting booth. Um, I, I agree with you, Joe, that uh, the journalists need to inform the American public what their counterparts across the country are thinking. But that is an information that is of any use until after the election. And then it's unquestionable how the American people feel about different issues and different candidates. Journalism is generally uh, focused on looking at the results as opposed to the anticipated results. And how should people use, how should the journalist um, audience use the information about who's ahead? Does it mean, oh, my, my guy is ahead, so I don't need to vote, or my guy is behind, I need to vote? How do you use that? How does the public put that information to gainful use? The poll that really matters is the one that's taken right before the election. And that is a snapshot, but it's also a prophecy too. If, if you have a, a real strong poll uh, right before an election, shortly before an election, then you can probably figure on that polls being accurate and in close, in corresponding very closely to the outcome of the election. But um, uh, the, Polls that are not done, that are conducted, and the last polls that are conducted a week or 10 days before an election can be notoriously off base. And we've seen this phenomenon time and again in the history of election polling, that polls that are not conducted right to the end can go badly wrong. That was a problem in 1948 with the Dewey defeats Truman election. It was a problem in Wisconsin in 2016 the most prestigious polling operation in that state ended its poll seven to nine days before the election. And it showed that Clinton had a six percentage point lead over Trump. Trump won by less than a percentage point. So you really do have a, a, the lesson that the pollsters should have learned long ago in 1948, if not later, is to continue polling right up as late as possible, right to election day. And um, the 1980 election 40 years ago is another case in point. There seemed to have been a fair amount of shifting to Ronald Reagan in the last days of that, of that election. So polls that were not taken in the final hours of the election were off or wrong. And uh, Warren Matofsky, one of the most brilliant innovators in election polling and opinion research over the past 40, 80 years, 60 years, um, he, he said after the 1980 election that he wishes he, he almost wants to, wanted to kick himself for not polling right to the very end. So that lesson is one that, that pollsters should have learned by now. And sometimes it seems that they haven't learned. And campaigns never take the results for granted. I mean, they are doing get out the vote activities right up until election day. So even if it looks like the candidates well ahead, the campaign will do everything it can, or strong campaigns will do everything they can to get their voters to the polls. That's right. In 2016, Hillary Clinton was campaigning in North Carolina in the early hours of election day. And, uh, and then on the way back, on the, on the, on the jet back uh, to, to New York, uh, they, they uh, were uh, swilling champagne aboard the jet in anticipation of her victory that night. But uh, a campaign that, that uh, seemed to be well ahead was campaigning right to the right to the end, right until the early hours of election day. Do you have any idea of the key postmortem conclusions about uh, why the pollsters got it so wrong in 2016? And do you think they they have adjusted their methods to 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 avoid the mistakes? <laughs> 
the pollsters are always working, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a very fertile field in terms of experimentation and research, and they're, and they're always looking for, for new approaches and uh, new and reliable approaches to get away from telephone-based surveys, which, you know, who answers a landline anymore? And, you know, telemarketing has in many respects destroyed that aspect of polling. So, so pollsters are always looking for new methods and new approaches to, to conduct reliable and responsible and uh, opinion polling. But uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really difficult to say whether um, the, these new techniques and these new methods are gonna pan out. They're gonna need some, some time and some experimentation. Uh, Internet-based polling is, is one that uh, looks very, very encouraging, but you know, it it's still has yet to, to fully prove itself. So we're in this moment in, in opinion research where there's a, an awful lot of churn going on, an awful lot of, of uh, new techniques being tried out, new methods that are being tested. Not, and we don't know what the next gold standard will be, if there will be a single gold standard. That's really the challenge for, for polling right now. I mean, we had landline phones for, for decades, and now, you know, what is the mix of cell phones or landlines? Uh, campaigns are still pretty reluctant to use internet polling, um, but it's become more and more, you know, common in all other kinds of survey research. So, in addition to the the problems in polling that Joe po points out in his book, we really are in a time when it's hard to know what's the best way to get an accurate sample. And survey researchers are trying different things every, every election cycle. That's for sure. And then there's some misconceptions that persist about, about polling too, that they aren't getting or reaching people who, um, uh, well, the, the response rates are low. There's no doubt about that. And, and people who want to, who pollsters want to interview often say no. In fact, to a, to a telephone survey, uh, a response rate of, of uh, 9% or 8% is, is not unheard of these days. So that's a real complication for polling. And uh, related to that in some respects is, is the uh, phenomenon or the supposed, supposed phenomenon of the, sh the shy Trump voter. In other words, one of the reasons that they got it wrong in 2016 supposedly was that Trump supporters were not telling pollsters that they really were Trump supporters. It was probably a socially desirable phenomenon at work, supposedly. But researchers have looked at this shy Trump phenomenon and have really not been able to find much evidence for it, and certainly not a lot of evidence to say that that factor was decisive in the 2016 outcome. But it's still still a phenomenon that, that bears attention and bears research. Uh, there, there was often a, a suspicion that there was a shy Reagan voter out there, that, 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 poll, that polls were not picking up Reagan's support because his supporters for socially desirable reasons weren't saying that they were in favor of this former actor for president. And uh, there's some evidence, but how decisive the shy voter phenomenon is, is, is still to be determined. One of the things I'm hearing from pollsters is that they're seeing a slight uptick in response rates uh, over the past few months because people are at home with their families and if somebody else calls them, they can talk to somebody else, they're, they're willing to do that. So that's right. I don't know. And there's been, there's been some, uh, you're, you're right, Candy, an uptick to maybe what, 15, 20%? Yeah, we're not looking at 40%. You know, 20 years ago would have looked just terrible as a, as a response rate. But nowadays, you know, a 15% or 20% response rate doesn't look too bad. And it is, uh, you're right. That has been reported by pollsters as saying that, that uh, people who find themselves in lockdown and at home during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, hell, they'll answer the phone. Yes, please talk to me. I'm tired of talking to my family. <laughs> when you were mentioning the, the shy voters, I had flashbacks to Richard Nixon's silent majority. Um, and I had problems uh, wrapping my mind around that, but I, I don't have any, a question there. I just wanted to to make that correlation. Um, well, you know, Richard Nixon took a lot of things for granted, and uh, one of those was a was a silent majority that was going to turn out in great numbers for him in 1968. And uh, Nixon really ran a very what I would call a, um, a smooth glide or glide path campaign. He really didn't take on seriously major issues of the day, including the Vietnam War. 
And in that way, he was kind of like Thomas Dewey in 1948, who, who ran a campaign that was very antiseptic. He wasn't shaking anybody up and uh, was thinking he was on a glide path to the presidency. And Dewey got defeated by Truman and Richard Nixon almost was upset by Hubert Humphrey in 1968. Um, do you think early voting will have any effect on the polls and or the election? That's a good question. It's a good question. And I mean, the election's in three months, but people are going to start voting early in some states in six weeks. Um, so, and, and I don't know that pollsters do a great job of taking that into account in trying to predict what the outcome's gonna be. It's really particularly difficult for exit pollers too to, to get a sense of, of uh, who's already voted and, and to get their um, feedback, if you will. Uh, exit polling has been done for many years and based on voters just having voted, just having left the polling place. And with, with early voting and absentee balloting, it, it is, a, is a complication that, that really has confounded some exit polls over the years. Um, there is continuing discussion in, in some circles um, around the, uh, the 2016 election uh, connected with Paul Manafort sharing polling data with Russia. Um, is that, whether it's true or not, I'm going to assume for the moment for the purpose of this discussion that may be true, would that have any significant effect on subsequent polls and the subsequent election. Well, was, I, I suppose he was accused of sharing internal polling data, not not public polling information. And uh, I don't know. Frankly, I just wonder. So what? I mean, I don't, I don't see why that would have been a major factor at all in the outcome of the 2016 election, which pretty clearly turned on upper Midwest states again: Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And uh, so I don't know. I don't. I don't see that as a major factor at all. Yeah, I, I guess that question would be based on some assumptions that we we don't necessarily need to get into here. Okay. Um, is horse race journalism coverage of who's ahead, who's going to win, and that sort of thing? Is that an intentional or unintentional form of a push poll? Is there a polling that measures? the effect of that type of coverage? Push polls are very, very different from scientific survey research. They're really much more voter contact efforts to try and persuade someone to vote for a particular candidate based on negative information about his or her opponent. So, so pushing is based only on negative information? Usually, yes. And most pollsters don't consider that survey research at all. Okay. And I don't think it's it's particularly ethical. Yeah, <laughs> sort of in the same category. Ethics of it are far beyond just questionable. It's kind of like a call-in poll too. You know, you, it, this, these used to be kind of uh, controversial back in the '80s and '90s. Uh, you know, you know, after a debate, you know, call this 800 number and, and tell us who you thought won the debate. And it's clearly unscientific and clearly not very reliable, but nonetheless, it it, it tells us maybe something that people are willing to get out of their chairs and, and call in. But uh, um, it's, it's sort of in that, same, in that same category. There are some people still arguing that the um, to predictions that Hillary was definitely going to win uh, had some effect in causing her to lose by keeping some of her supporters away from the polls. How valid is that? Is there any way to prove or disprove the uh, validity of that assertion? Well, it's, it's, it's tough to prove. I think that she supposedly had a real strong get out the vote campaign. In fact, her, some of her supporters were touting that, that they were among early voters as well as uh, day of the election voters were, were really going to be turned out in great numbers. So um, it's hard to know. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it is a potential phenomenon it, it, when, a, when a candidate looks like he or she is so far ahead, and the poll-based statistical models that I mentioned earlier, Huffington Post among others, had her at 98.2% chance of winning. I mean, it's, I don't know how much that dissuades people from, from, from voting. 
it's an argument that was raised as long ago, at least as long ago as 1948, when when Tom Dewey was the Republican candidate, was supposedly so far ahead that, that many of his supporters did not vote that day. And the turnout in 1948 dropped off dramatically from previous years. So that may have been one indicator that yes, there was some effect of the polls giving a well an impression that there's no need to go out and, and vote. It's it's kind of a kind of a stupid linkage, but nonetheless, it's it's one that um, that persists in the history of election polling. And that's why, as I said earlier, campaigns. Good campaigns don't take anything for granted, and they're trying to get their supporters to the polls. That's right. Uh, whatever the whatever the survey research says. Okay, we're we're coming just to the end of our time together. Uh, so I do want to bounce back to the original question, um, in a sense. Is is this going to be another electoral surprise? What? How likely is it? What are the factors that would uh, determine? Is there something you can see? now that might make this another surprise election in the sense that it disagrees with what the pollsters are saying. I think so, John. I think the history of election polling tells us that we should expect surprises. It may not be a replay of 2016. It might not be a replay of 2012 or 1948. It could be something different altogether that we haven't anticipated. But expecting surprises and being wary about polls and uh, and the, and the number of polls, it's a, it's a huge number of polls being conducted these days. I think we have to uh, treat them cautiously and it's not a bad idea to be a little bit suspicious about them. And in keeping in mind that the history of US presidential elections is studded with, with examples of election polling failure. And that's, that's important to keep in mind. Okay, uh, so we will end on that note but I'd like to thank everyone for participating, our, pan, our panelists, Candy Nelson and Joe Campbell, and the audience who submitted excellent questions that made me look like a smart and engaged questioner. I appreciate your participation. And I, I hope and know you've learned from this and probably formed a few more questions uh, as we roll toward the election. So John, I think we should also mention that Matt Siklecki and his colleagues in the school of communication, Tia Millage and Brianna uh, Williams, uh, were really very instrumental in putting this program together, as well as, as our colleagues in the School of Public Affairs, including Charles Leggett and uh, Lisa Manning and uh, Che Rowe. Uh, they were really very instrumental. I think that they deserve a, a tip of the chapeau for their help and their work. Absolutely. There are always people who make what we do possible, and we should never forget them. Thank you for reminding me, Joe. And I think Laura Denardis deserves a tip of the chapeau, too, because of uh, her uh, fine welcoming remarks and her generosity in making this program possible as well. Yes. And she always does more than we would consider humanly possible. Thank you, Laura. Okay, so I guess we will be signing off now and uh, thanking you for your participation and attendance. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Thanks, Candy.